Hey, Psych 213 class, this is lecture 12, where we're going to talk about retrieval. And if you remember, retrieval is just getting information out of long-term memory and back into our working memory. So, like, for example, if I were to ask you who's the president of the college in New Jersey, if you can pull that name out, then you have retrieved information from your long-term memory. So a couple of things uh, about retrieval. One thing to remember, keep in mind, is that retrieval is a process, right? So that means that we can do things to make it better. We can do things to make it worse. And we're going to talk about some of that in this particular lecture. So a couple of general points to make before we get started here. Memory does not work like a video camera. I know we've talked about this in class before, but uh, it's not what we say veridical. It's not always truthful meaning that memory fails in some predictable, uh, another word for that is systematic ways. We're going to talk a lot about that in our lecture 14, where we talk about distortions of memory. We'll see exactly how memory fails and what kinds of things cause it to fail in predictable ways. While that is true, so memory isn't you know perfect in every way, Memory is really good for the gist of information, so it's really easy to get sort of hung up on the fact that your memory is fallible and forget that memory is really pretty good for the broad outlines. As long as we stick to the core details and don't push for the tiny details, your memory is actually pretty good. Now what we do do, or we, what we do know is we store parts of the memories and then we rebuild our memories based around a lot of what we already know. That's what we're going to focus on in this particular lecture. So we're going to store those core parts in our memory and then when we go to retrieve it we're actually rebuilding or reconstructing the memory based on lots of things that are around us or things that we already know. And This is what we'll focus on. This is the process that we're talking about and this is what it means to say that memory is reconstructive or re rebuilding memories. So one of the things that we rebuild memories on is schema. So schema is an organized structure that captures our knowledge and expectations about some aspect of our world. So it's really, if you think about it, it's semantic memory for some aspect of our world, right? So you have a schema for what happens when you go to a restaurant. Or you're in New Jersey, you have a schema for what happens when you go to a gas station, right? And we know, or we sort of experience situations where we don't have a schema. So like when I first moved to New Jersey, I didn't really know what to do uh, at a gas station. I was like, do I tip the guy? Do I not tip the guy, right? So all of these things go through your mind until you develop a schema for what it's like, right? Um, so it's knowledge about our world in some kind of way. There's a couple of classic studies which demonstrate how we use schema to rebuild our memories. And one of these comes from a study by Bartlett. It's called The War of the Ghosts. And so Bartlett had his participants memorize this Native American tale, uh, and they were told to study it, try to study it, or memorize it word for word. So here's the first part of it. I'm going to let you pause the screen here. I want you to read it, and then I'm going to switch over to the second part of it. You're going to have to pause the video there to read the second part. So here's the second part. Pause the video here, and then you can read this and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. So Bartlett had his subjects read this passage. As you can tell, it's kind of a strange tale, and it's really hard even for Americans to sort of have a, a framework for this Native American tale. You can imagine Bartlett's um, subjects were uh, English citizens from the UK, so they had even less of a knowledge of Native American culture. So let me read you some of the... Um, recalls some of the examples of the recalls that his subjects had after studying this uh, word for word. So this is after four months. Here's what somebody says. I have no idea of the title. There were two men in a boat sailing around towards an island. When they approached the island, some natives came running towards them and informed them that there was fighting going on the island and invited them to join. One said to the other, you had better go. I cannot very well because I have relatives expecting me and they will not know what has become of me. But you have no one to expect you. So one accompanied the natives, but the other one returned. Here's the part I can't remember. What I don't know is how the man got to the fight. However, anyhow, the man was in the midst of the fighting, 
and was wounded. The natives endeavored to persuade the man to return. He assured them that he had not been wounded. I have an idea that his fighting won the admiration of the natives. The wounded man ultimately fell unconscious. He was taken from the fighting by the natives. Then I think it is the natives describe what happened. They seem to have imagined seeing a ghost coming out of his mouth. Really, it was a materialization of his breath. I know this phrase is not in the story, but that is the idea I have. Ultimately, the man died at dawn the next day. So as you can tell, that's not an exact recall. It's, uh, it's a, he has some of the core details, right? But uh, there's some lots of information missing in that recall. So here's a recall of another subject after a six-month delay. Four men came down to the water. They were told to get in a boat and take arms with them. They inquired, what arms? And we answered, arms for battle. When they came to the battlefield, they heard a great noise and shouting, and a voice said, the black man is dead. And he brought to the place where they were and laid on the ground, and he foamed at the mouth. So that's another example of a recall. So Bartlett studied these recalls, and he uh, discovered several patterns in people's recalls. Omissions. So omissions, subjects forgot a lot of details. So things just are missing in the story. That shouldn't surprise you. And what Bartlett called rationalizations, right? So rationalizations, so here's here's how Bartlett, or here, here's how it's described. Bartlett uh, noted that unusual or unexpected, unexpected features were interpreted in a form more consistent with the subject's prior experience, or another way to say that is schema, right? For example, one of the recalls presented above, something black came out of his mouth became, he foamed at the mouth, right? So they didn't have a schema for something black coming out of the mouth, but they did for foamed at the mouth. So it became reinterpreted in a consistent, a form consistent with a schema. Bartlett also noted dominant details. So remember like our gist of our memory. So Bartlett detected a tendency for certain features to take on critical importance and become more and more dominant with the successive recalls of the material. That is certain features became the central theme around which recall was organized, despite not there being actual main theme of the original passage. For example, subjects tended to tended over time to make the death scene in the War of the Ghosts the central theme of the recalls, even though the death scene only comprises one small small part of the original story. And then what he called transformation of detail. Specific items in the original materials were often changed in a familiar form. The War of the Ghosts, for example, the canoe was often recalled as a boat, right? So <clears throat> a canoe is a is an Indian uh, term, right? We're comfortable with that. That's part of our, <clears throat> excuse me, that's part of our language, but not necessarily part of uh, British language in 1932. So you can see that uh, Bartlett's discovery, a couple of things, right? Uh, one is they're using their schema, their pre-existing knowledge of the world to recall things. And they're recalling the information that's consistent with their schema, right? And the other thing is they forget a lot. Right, so what they do remember is mem remembered around a schema. Another example of a study showing us that we use schemas is uh, Bransford and Johnson study. So what they did is they had people study this passage. So you're gonna have to pause the video here and read the passage, but they studied this passage and they were instructed to memorize this passage word for word. So go ahead and pause and read it. So. People, as you might imagine, struggled with remembering this particular passage. They remembered more, though, when they were instructed to recall the clothes washing passage. So it is a passage about washing your clothes. And when they activated that schema, people actually remembered more details because you can sort of have a framework for that uh, particular story. right? So we use schema. There's all kinds of other studies. Those are just a couple of classic ones that show us that we use schema to re reconstruct our memories. But we also use cues to reconstruct our memories. And there's lots of examples of this too. So a classic example, the Carmichael et al. study in 1932, they had participants memorize these stimulus figures. So they were instructed to study these for a while, and then they were asked to draw them. And they were asked to draw them based on a word label. So one group got, for example, eyeglasses. So here's the original stimulus figure. And they were told, hey, draw the eyeglasses. Well, what would happen is people would bend the little line in between the two circles. 
I've done this in some demonstrations before, and sometimes you'll see people draw the actual hook of an eyeglass onto the image. Now contrast this with the other group who got the dumbbells. They don't have a bend in the middle of it. In fact, they'll elongate the center because the dumbbells are a little bit further apart and you need a place to place your hand. Um, so people are reconstructing. So if our memory was photographic, they would draw this stimulus figure just as it is. But instead, they're reconstructing, in this case, based on the label. So they distort the image consistent with the eyeglasses or consistent with the dumbbells. Notice that this X with two lines over top of it. If you're given an hourglass, you tend to bend these lines like an hourglass looks, right? If you're given a table, you tend to sort of make it look like a table. Another one that works really well when I've done these demonstrations is a ship's wheel. So you'll see them put the spoke, sometimes they'll even put a center and put the spokes in a ship's wheel uh, or the sun. They have like the little wavy lines are more bent and curvy and radiate out like a sun. Or you have the seven and the four, you get very different images, right? So the idea here again is if our memory was uh, vertical or photographic or whatever you want, we wouldn't have these distortions based on the cues that we were given, but we do. Another example of cues can be the context in which you learn the information. So one of my favorite studies, uh, Godden and Badley, this is the same Alan Badley of working memory discussions. What they did is they had uh, participants study word lists. They either studied on land or they put on some scuba gear and they went underwater and learned wordless underwater and then as you can see they tested them in two different places either on land or underwater and what they found is if you studied on land and were tested on land you did better than if you studied on land and were tested underwater and vice versa right so uh, what it's showing us here is that the match between where you studied and where you tested is particularly important right when you have matching cues from the test context study and test context you have better memory. Uh, this should sound a little familiar to you, right? It should sound like transfer appropriate processing that we talked about before. Yeah, it is. It's another sort of version of that transfer appropriate processing. Matching, in this case, contextual cues helps your memory. Cues can also apply to uh, source memory. So Dotson and Sherman Moore showed this. So remember source memory, you could have people study uh, words heard in a male or a female voice and then ask them which voice said it. Well, you can do a test where it's all male voice talking again or all female voice talking again. And of course, when your voices match, you have better memory. When there's a mismatch, there's worse memory. We did the same thing for seeing and hearing words. So you could see a list of words, you could hear a list of words. And then we tested them and you see we got a graph a lot like Godden and Badley in that when you have all of a, the test is visual or all the test is auditory, you have sort of this mismatch effect going on, match effect being better, mismatch being worse with source memory, right? So these were source memory judgments. Cues can be uh, internal states as well. So a classic study of this is the Goodwin et al. paper. And what they did is they had people encode words again, and they were either sober or yes, they got them intoxicated and tested their memory. And then they had a, um, so that, I'm sorry, this is encoding state, sober or intoxicated. And then they had a retrieval state where they were either sober or intoxicated. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing errors. So there is a drug main effect here. And in these drug studies, a lot of times you see a drug main effect, meaning the, there is a, a decrease in memory overall when you're under the influence of drug. But when you're looking at errors, notice that you had 1.25 errors here your errors go up, even though you studied sober and you're tested intoxicated, your errors go up. But look at the intoxicated group. Their worst condition was when they were intoxicated at encoding and when they were tested sober. So actually, if you were intoxicated at encoding, your better best chance of remembering things is being intoxicated again, right? So this is what was called state-dependent learning theory. So if you're really caffeinated when you study something, you probably should be really caffeinated again when you're uh, trying to remember that information. But again, my word of caution is uh, don't, there is a drug main effect, so don't use drugs, but you know, uh, if you're trying to remember when you were intoxicated, best chances if you're gonna be intoxicated again.
So cues can also be moot. So Gordon uh, Bauer and his colleagues, what they showed is they had people come into the laboratory and they learn a list of words and you can put people in a uh, mood by having them by having them like read a story or write a story about a happy situation or read or write a story about a sad situation. And what they found is the same kind of effects that we were talking about before. So if your mood matches when you were studying, this is sort of study mood up here, and this is test mood, and in this case, a recall test, test mood, if it matches, your memory is much better. If there's a mismatch, your memory is hurt. So again, cues can be mood as well. So this suggests, uh, or has some suggestions for better retrieval overall, like during exams or even just during life if you want to remember something and you can't remember. What it suggests is it should suggest that if you're if you're studying for an exam, you should study like you're going to be tested, right? So remember, that's that transfer appropriate processing concept. You could even extend it into studying in the classroom that you're going to be tested in. This would have more of an effect if you suffer from anxiety and things like that. And you want to decrease your anxiety. That could be a good way is to sort of anticipate uh, what the uh, examination period will be like. It might help you calm down. Small effects, though, uh, better off to um, study and using coding techniques like the kinds of questions that you're going to be asking. That's a bigger effect than like the physical location. But if you are trying to remember, let's say you're trying to remember on an exam or even just in general, try to reinstate the cues that uh, that might trigger a memory, right? So the cues could be internally generated, right? You could use them. That, this is how mnemonics work, right? So you could use a mnemonic to help you remember. So if you're trying to remember somebody's name, you could run through the alphabet. Does it start with A? Does it start with B? Does it start with C? And eventually, if you get to the right cue, it might trigger pull out help you pull out their name that really works uh, so it can be it can be valuable sometimes you're learning about the method of loci from reading moonwalking with einstein again using uh locations that you know and vivid imagery to serve as a cue to retrieve your memories you can create your own cues i had a uh, i usually tell a story here where when i met my wife uh, i had to remember her name and i used a mnemonic to remember remember her name because as it turns out I met her in a bar and we were intoxicated so I knew I had to have a, a particular mnemonic cue to remember uh, her name so I did so I'm not going to tell you what that is here but if you ask me on canvas I might be willing to sort of tell you what the mnemonic was the other thing is like if you're taking an exam you can get cues from the exam itself this is actually a good test strategy read through the exam if you don't know something right away read through the exam there might be another word another cue uh, that triggers a memory and you can come back to that item and answer it and you should just read over the entire exam sometimes particularly if you're stuck and you know you you studied something but you just can't remember it in the moment use the cues on the exam at all uh, use the cues on the exam as a uh, as a trigger to try to reinstate that memory and get that back it's a really good uh, test strategy so that's it for retrieval uh, next up is we're going to talk about forgetting